I'm David Payton, I'm a professor of industrial economics at Nottingham University. Great pleasure to be here. Uh, and David set up the question really nicely. We've heard lots of talk of assisted dying. The work I've done is focused on the US. And since um, Oregon, well, the end of 1997, it really came into effect in 1998. We've now got 11 US states which have introduced assisted, uh, physician assisted suicide in some form. Montana actually did introduce a law as a Judicial case that effectively changed how uh, practice was carried out. Um, and this is fantastic for um, economists like us who don't care about morals or ethics or any of that sort of thing, um, but are interested in the data. These are a series of natural experiments which you know, give, give you a wealth of, of, of data potentially, lots of difficulties as well in trying to establish what you're trying to establish. Um, but it's worth taking, you know, so it's just giving you that just gives a point about Oregon that we've got a you know, a huge number of assisted suicides in Oregon now. So 223 assisted suicides, 833 unregulated suicides. So we're talking about quite big, uh, quite big numbers. Um, well, let's take a step back a bit. Though I'm an economist with no morals or ethics, of course, the ethics are really what's important here. You know, the data might help influence our understanding of the question in the context, but really questions of right or wrong, what the law should say, in principle, I think matter more. And this is my, my position, which sort of I think it's consistent with some, not all of what we've heard, heard today, but a lot about autonomy and some about helping people who are at risk of suicide. I think actually the, the issue of autonomy can be a little bit um, overemphasized because you can have cases where there, you, you really do have what seems to be autonomy, whether it really is autonomy, but all the, all the laws focus on particular groups, typically the disabled, Terminally ill, the elderly, and now increasingly those with, uh, with mental illness. Okay? And I think fundamentally these laws discriminate fatally against vulnerable groups because they breach the principle that it's okay to kill an innocent human being. And they say, well, okay, it's, it's okay to, to kill an innocent human being, but if you have this particular criteria. And I'm, I've always been influenced by the, the case of Alison Davis. Which many of you will know about from many years ago. She was somebody who had for many years a desire to commit suicide, which was expressed with several attempts. And many times her friends found her to the hospital, but she was very angry with it. She wasn't happy at all. It wasn't sort of a one off, it was sustained. But actually, after a number of years, her perspective completely changed for completely different reasons. She was severely disabled and extreme pain, which the doctors could do nothing about. But what happened was her. If you like mental illness or depression changed, and she ended up living for some 10, 15 years after these suicide attempts with a completely different attitude to life. And what Alison said was, well, actually, I want the right to say that I want to kill myself without somebody then saying, okay, we'll help you. And I think that's a contradiction with some of the things we've heard today, that if you have a right to die, there's a contradiction there with saying you can then help somebody to stop themselves dying, because Alison Point was, well, it's a bit like if I'm at the top of a building, I'm about to jump off. And what you're saying is because I'm in a wheelchair and disabled, compare me to say something like, like myself, who's not, who's uh, you know, of, of sound health, people would say, well, the person of sound health, we will help them avert suicide. We'll try to persuade them to get off that bridge or off that high building. We'll save people love you and so on. Whereas Alice would say, well, if I was there and this law was passed, you would have a duty to push me off. And for her, she, she felt directly discriminated against. So that's the ethics, which, of course, I don't have as an, uh, as an economist. Um, so what do they have to do with it, with economists, BAS laws? Well, we've probably heard today we set up the arguments. So I'll, I'll sort of very briefly won't really hash all the arguments. You know, it can go both ways. You can have a laws which um, accept suicide in certain circumstances when assisted by doctors. It might change the culture. Economists talk about costs. I don't mean the monetary costs. You know, it can make it easier. Some people find it very difficult. How do I commit suicide? Where do I get the means to do it? Am I going to have pain? Is it going to be successful? Well, if it's physician assisted suicide, you may reduce the cost of doing that. You may change the culture, the idea of suicide contagion. I'm sure that um, psychiatrists watching that, you know, aware of this, or psychologists that uh, you, know, you can have these sort of clusters of suicide which can, can occur. So you know, there's a danger that when you talk about it, it's recognized, you may get some sort of contagion. Right. But then, as David has said, you may also have this argument that you could reduce suicide. And um, in the economics world and the legal world, we have the arguments of Richard Posner. 
I don't know whether he really called himself an economist or a legal um, theorist, so I don't know. But his, his argument is exactly what David said, that the option of suicide may make you less likely to commit suicide um, now, because you know it's there in the future. When you get to the future, actually perhaps things weren't as bad as you thought, so you don't commit suicide. You may see total suicides go down, you may see total suicides go up, but, uh, but unassisted suicides go down. We may see uh, both go up. We don't know, that's an empirical question. So, um, let's do all the, just set it up. I won't give you lots of, I, I can't believe David said that statistics were dry and abstract, was that the word? This is my whole life's, life's work. That, that day, uh, no, I'm not saying you're, you're wrong, but um, just, just to give you an idea, this is what happened in Oregon. So the, the top line, the green line, uh, the, is a total suicide rate. So combining unassisted and assisted suicide, the blue line at the bottom is non-PAS states of all other, all other states. And you can see, well, Oregon already had quite a high rate of suicide when they legalized their law. That could be an important issue. And you can see, well, it's a little bit hard to tell for the unregulated rate. Probably, if anything, it's increased relative to other states. But certainly, total suicides have gone up. And we can look at various other states. I've got a few graphs. I'll, I'll skip through them. But there's lots of problems with this. Because, of course, you know, we've got Oregon. We've got all the other states. Maybe Oregon is a very different type of state. So when you're looking at the data, you need to think, well, you know, what would have happened had Oregon not implemented this suicide rate? Maybe their demographics, their social changes would have meant that their suicides would have gone up anyway, for whatever reason. Very hard to know. This is just a, just a single case. Um, and that's one of the issues which uh, um, I, want, I want to talk about. Um, David mentioned a paper that himself and me did a few years ago. This is in the Southern Medical Journal, which I think was the first uh, paper to look specifically at this issue. It's a preliminary study, really, because we only effectively have two states, Oregon and Washington State, to look at in, in the US. Um, our conclusion was, well, PAS tended to increase total suicide, may have increased other suicides as well, certainly didn't decrease them, but the results were a bit less robust. Okay, so that was a, the, the, uh, a point uh, a, a few years ago. And what we've done since, or well, myself and Sura Falgerma, who's a colleague in the School of Economics, is a paper which was published earlier this year in the European Economic Review, which essentially extends that work which David and I did. So, um, more comprehensive. So, we've now got, we haven't got full 11 states because we ended our study in suicides in 2019. There's always a lag in the data, but actually, it's probably the right time to end it because 2020, you've got COVID, and that may well have upset, you know, being very different in different states in terms of impact on suicide. So we go up to 2019, it means we have 10 states with at least some uh, data on um, assisted suicide. We use panel event study regressions, and um, we always like to sort of make, make people think we're very clever by using fancy words. But most of economics is really very, very simple. Um, but just crowded in, uh, in fancy words to make us sound, sound clever. But synthetic control method, this is the latest sort of uh, empirical tool that uh, it, it is quite popular for looking at these sort of policy interventions with an aim of trying to establish causality. We're getting, you can't quite get to a randomized controlled trial, but you know, as close as you can get to that sort of approach with, it, with a natural experiment like we have. I'll give you a flavor of what we do. So the panel event study regressions essentially say, well, if you look at the average change in suicide rates, and we look at two, we look at total suicide rates and unassisted rates on their own. Okay, so we look at both those questions which David talked talk about. Uh, and to say, well, what happened before and after you introduce these laws? Because of course, we've seen that Oregon has relatively high suicide rates already. So we don't, we can't be saying, oh look, Oregon's got high suicide rates and it's got assisted suicide, so one causes the other. But let's look before and after um, the laws introduced relative to what was going on in other states before and after. And one of the advantages of the, the different timing, you've got lots of different times, because of course it can be national effects going on, recessions we know lead to an increase in suicide, one laws, all sorts of other things may have gone on at the same time, which in this approach, the sort of a multivariate approach, you can control for to some extent. And the event study, one of the key things in the event study approach is to say, well, once you've done all these adjustments for the fact that these states are, you know, maybe quite fundamentally different in all sorts of demographic or other ways. Can you then sort of see some sort of statistical similarity before the laws came in? So we have a sort of parallel trend assumption they, they call really saying, you know, once you've done the, the controls and adjustments, do you have similar trends before the laws? That's one of the sort of, sort of tests. So that's one approach we take. The other approach is this synthetic control method. 
And it, it essentially said, well, you, you try to get a weighted mix of states that are similar um, in all sorts of statistical dimensions to the states that have had the intervention. And then you look at what you, you're using them as a counterfactual. So you're trying to say, well, we think if this state hadn't introduced the law, this mix of states give you the best guess as to what you would have expected to see. And of course, you know, we, we, we haven't observed it, so we can't be 100% sure. So you, you can have sort of confidence intervals. You try to get a mix of states so you're not focused on one particular case, but maybe a you know, data mess up or, or whatever it may, may be. You control the match groups by what we call confounders by you know, politics, there may be different states which are more likely to introduce assisted suicide, maybe Democrat leaning states perhaps, and may also be more likely to have different trends in suicide rates for all sorts of reasons. Maybe they're less religious or have different demographics or whatever it might be. You try to control for that. It's really been quite, quite popular. Look, people have looked at it through what would happen to, to GDP in the UK, and you look at a mix of uh, other, other economies, which you, 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 know, you, you, you try and match as best you can. Tobacco control pro programs in states, there's all sorts of areas where people have looked at this. So it's, it's quite a nice method. I think there's no, you know, we're, we're dealing with statistics, so you can't say, well, you know, this is the truth. But I think you can attack the data, if you like, um, uh, in lots of different ways to try and tease out. Uh, some people would say torture, but I think, you know, to tease out causality as best you can. And I, I think you've got to be cautious with, with data, of course. And I think one of the things we, we've tried to do in all the empirical work is to say, well, this is what we think is a right model. This seems to get to the heart of the causality, but we've got two different approaches to it. But then to check, well, how sensitive is it? You know, if you drop, is that all driven by one of the states where maybe there's something funny going on? If you change the mix of you know, confounders available, so does that change things? If you look at the slightly different time periods, slightly different approaches, there's actually a couple of other dynamic difference and difference approaches, they call it, which uh, referees ask us, to, ask us to do. So that's you know, one of the things we do. I would say that probably, I you will all read the, the paper, very occasionally people do read the economics paper. If you look at the citation indexes, they're not, they're not very high. But if you do read, I think you'll see that you know, we, the results are generally consistent across the different ways we try to attract, uh, attack um, the data. So a little bit about what we found then. This is a, a big table. Um, just to, to, to give you a flavor, we, we looked at overall suicide rates, female, male, and then broke it down by some age groups. The, the key things are those things where it says same year, one, two, three, four, five, six. With the uh, event study, you're looking at to see whether you're allowing effects to be different in different time periods. Okay? And essentially, when you see the stars, that means they're statistically significant. Okay, so that means it looks like the effect is different to zero, statistically. Uh, if it's positive, it means that the intervention had a positive effect on, so it was estimated to have a positive effect on suicide rates with all the controls that are in there. But this thing here is ATC, that's the average treatment, which gives you the sort of overall net policy effect if you wanted to sort of summarize things completely. Essentially, this is saying when you look at total suicide rates, there's a very strong and significant positive impact. So overall, total suicide rates go up. There are some differences. Actually, it looks like um, males are bigger than females. That's not the case either, the absolute level. Female suicide rates are much, much smaller than male suicide rates. So in percentage terms, this is a much bigger effect for females than for males, okay? It's also a much bigger effect for the older age groups. And there's some, you can sort of track back to what Poslan was saying, well, you know, there may be an argument for looking at differences in age groups. We wouldn't expect much of an effect for under 35. So there's virtually no assisted suicide for under 35s in the, in the states. You know, we may be going to that in, in the discussion. Um, what about unassisted suicide rates? The, the general patterns, so the sign of these things are the same, it's positive. The numbers are much smaller and significance is lower. But if you look at the overall policy effect for the for in total, it's still pretty significant. So this is saying, um, you know, significance at much better than the 1% the level. In other words, we find evidence of a positive impact on unassisted suicide rates. When we introduce uh, assisted physician-assisted suicide, it's not just that total suicide rates go up, and certainly it's not that unassisted rates go down, they do seem to go up. That finding is not quite so strongly significant um, across all the ways we attack the data. It's generally true, certainly not true for all of the, um, all of the breakdowns. And um, you can see this here is sort of the p values. So the smaller this is, the more statistically significant we are. So it's a much stronger result for females uh, than males, predominating in this age group. 
And you, you look at the SCN, the synthetic control method, it's got a nice picture. There are some, some numbers as, as well, but perhaps easier to see. So this is the intervention. That's the first year, if you like, when the, when the law came in. And you've got the, the treated as a blue line. So that's the assisted suicide states. The red line is your synthetic control. And when you see that divergence, that's suggesting that the law, at least if you believe the SCN method, it's suggesting that there was a call, cause of influence. So if you hadn't had the law, they would have had lower suicide rates. That's all being that you accept the assumptions that we use to build up that synthetic control. And that's statistically significant and, and quite strongly so. So the pattern is the same. When you look at unassisted suicide rates, it's not quite a lot more variation going on in terms of the, the differences, but still it's, it's generally statistically um, significant. What, what, does, what does it mean in terms of the actual uh, numbers? Well, the average effect, if you look at the overall effect of summarizing across all years, and clearly there's a, there's a temporal effect, and you've got states at all sort of different stages, but it's, I think it's not unreasonable to talk about the headline effect. Roughly, we're coming to an 18% increase in total suicides. Okay, that's from the, from the panel data, but it's reasonably consistent with the synthetic control method result. So strongly significant, uh, statistically significant, very robust. Whichever way you torture or interrogate the data, you come up with a you know, reasonably strong result on this. Just in terms of what that would mean in the UK, there's roughly 6,000 suicides take place in the UK each year. If that translated, and there may be all sorts of reasons why you think it wouldn't in terms of cultural differences, we're talking in the region of 100, potentially 1,000, sorry, extra suicides in the UK. I think, I think we can say, well, you know, we're finding meaningful effects that are not just statistically significant, but we would say economically or socially significant as well. I'm not talking about, uh, about tiny numbers. Obviously, smaller in terms of unassisted suicide. Um, if we looked at the headline for unassisted suicide, much smaller, rather than 18%, 6%, still statistically significant, not quite as robust, as I said. Um, age and gender effects. So very clear that the oldest groups, the effects are stronger. But I think quite interestingly, particularly for women, you do see this much, much bigger effect for women. A 40% increase in total suicides is sort of a headline. And there's lots of different ways you can interpret that, which I'll, I'll, I'll very, very briefly articulate in a, in a second. But I think that's something which has perhaps been under looked at, sort of gender differences and impact of some of these laws. You, you, you could sort of, um, well, I'll briefly say that, you know, you could paint this as a sort of positive thing that you know, previously women didn't have the ability to, whatever reason, or had less ability to, um, you know, to commit suicide or to find the means to do it, and this is sort of free them. Or you could take another view and say, well, um, perhaps women, because of their circumstances in terms of caring responsibilities or um, lack of people, you know, to, to care for them, if you like, the pressure they feel when they're vulnerable and dying may be on average higher than for men, and then, so they may feel more pressure to make use of assisted suicide than the uh, men, which is, of course, not, you know, not quite a, a rosy way of painting. Um, what about some other, other evidence? Uh, a strange guy called Jones um, looked, had a paper recently looking at a series of, uh, of European countries, not doing regression analysis, but some, you know, uh, essentially the sort of a uh, little bit more than descriptive stats, you know, looking at pairs of countries, some which had introduced assisted suicide or euthanasia, others which hadn't, and looking at patterns of data, also broken down by uh, sex. So this is a headline finding, no reduction in non-assisted suicide. And that was quite important because I think in our paper, you know, we found there was an increase, but you can be pretty confident that there was, you know, there was no decrease. You can be less confident that that increase was really, really robust statistically. But of course, this is the argument that people have been making. Actually, this is a way of reducing unassisted suicide. But pretty ambiguously, um, you know, we're seeing an increase in, uh, in total suicides. So this is one of David's graphs, which is uh, cut, cut and pasted, looking at comparing Switzerland and Australia, just to give you an idea of the sort of almost Austria, indeed, thank you, um, for, for males and, and females. And I think it's really much, much more worth looking at David's paper because it's much easier to see the pattern of what's going on in these different countries than the than our, our paper, but uh, you know, you don't want to wade through the, through the stats, and there's lots of really interesting stuff in there. Um, so, you know, essentially, the, the story is consistent in Europe with uh, what's been going on in the States. The other one I wanted to mention was Canetto and Macintosh, who just sort of focus one of the few papers that focus on the gender differences, also finds 
um, they look at the states and they find the same conclusion. It impacts disproportionately on women. And they have, they, they sort of really buy into that sort of more negative view. They, they see that as uh, you know, the result of um, extra pressure that women feel on average in very vulnerable situations um, where you're subject to, or where su assisted suicide is, um, is an option. So very strong evidence from lots of countries that assisted suicide laws lead to increases in total suicide rates. Weaker evidence um, that they increase unassisted suicide rates, but crucially no evidence that they reduce unassisted suicide and women affected more than men. And we go back to where we started, if you like, you know, this doesn't tell us whether assisted suicide laws are right or wrong. They're right or wrong in themselves. And you can believe this to be true and still think well, it's people's right to determine when, when they should kill themselves. Or you could believe that it's a, you know, that it's a fundamental breach of people's human rights to allow these, uh, these laws because you target vulnerable groups. The ethics are still the determinant of how, whether these laws should be passed, but at least on one aspect where people have used it to try and um, uh, argue for a change in the law in favour of assisted suicide, the data does not back it up. And indeed, if you see any suicide as a tragedy in itself, the data would suggest there are serious consequences um, from introducing some of these laws. 